This short film will view the ground where the Battle of Flodden was fought. It will consider how the landscape, topography, geology and hydrology affected the course of the battle and helped bring about an unlikely outcome to this last major border conflict. The iconic granite cross on the top of Piper's Hill marks the position of the English Centre Division and is likely to have been used as the command post from where the Lord Admiral directed the opening phases of the battle. A geological fault line runs along the steep northern face of Brankston Hill. With well-drained Carboniferous rock on this, the English side of the valley, but impervious volcanic rock underlying the Scottish battle line. In 1513, because of weeks of bad weather, the ground underfoot was sodden and the battle was fought in a howling gale and driving rain. And today, the valley still floods in periods of wet weather. In late afternoon of the 9th of September 1513, the English approached from the north. The vanguard, along with the artillery, crossed the River Till at Twizel Bridge, four miles to the north of here. The main body of the English army crossed the river about two miles upstream, near Castle Heaton. The English find the Scots already arrayed along the crest of Brankston Hill and rapidly deploy their forces to counter the positions of the Scottish divisions. At about four in the afternoon, battle opens with an artillery exchange. The heavy Scottish guns have been hastily dragged from Flodden Hill. They fire a 30 or 60 pound ball, but after each shot, they are slow to reposition, reload and aim and fire. Firing from the height of Brankston Hill, many balls overshoot their target and others fall to strike the soft ground at a steep angle and cause only point damage and few casualties. These heavy guns were ideal for battering down castle walls but were not effective as field pieces. In contrast, the light English field guns are quick to reposition, aim and fire, and shooting up the slope of Brankston Hill are able to cut swathes through the packed ranks of Scottish pikes. Now, taking many casualties, the Scottish pikes of Hume and Huntley are forced to move down Brankston Hill to engage with the smaller English vanguard. Here, the slope is regular and relatively gentle. The Scottish pike formations are able to keep their tight formation and their essential steady forward momentum. There is no valley and no marshy ground at the base of the slope, and the Scots are able to proceed to the flat ground without hindrance. The English vanguard has no answer to the overwhelming power and momentum of the well-ordered ranks of pikes, and many run from the field. Disaster looms, but the day is saved for Edmund Howard and England by the timely intervention of Dacre's horse, who ride through the valley to the north of Brankston village and rescue the situation. Human Huntley's advance is halted, and the Scottish vanguard is unable to roll down the flank of the English centre. For whatever reason, Hume and Huntley now leave the field and take no further part in the battle. The advantage of the Scots' early success has been lost. The cost will be great. James IV's plan was, or should have been, 
to first take on and defeat the weakest division, the English vanguard, and then roll down the flank, catching the English centre in a front and flank pincer movement. From the English position on Piper's Hill, the Lord Admiral has seen disaster unfolding on his right flank, and directly ahead, arrayed along the crest of Brankston Hill, he can also see the massed ranks of 8,000 pikes of the Scottish centre. Here, the slope of Brankston Hill is steep, but unknown to the Scots, further down the slope, the ground is saturated. Tramping feet will turn scrubland into mud. The Scots now move to engage in battle. As they advance, some soldiers slip, some fall, some drop their pikes, which become trip hazards. The ranks begin to falter and lose their tight formation. Forward movement slows. But in the valley bottom, the ground becomes a boggy morass of knee-deep mud. As the English centre, armed with billhooks and longbows, advances to meet the Scots head-on, they still expect an attack from the right flank. Prospects are not good. The advance continues, and the flank attack still does not materialise. The English take a defensive line on the ridge on their side of the valley, and now, holding the high ground, they wait for the Scots. In the clinging mud of the valley, the Scots' forward movement is nigh on impossible, but the ranks behind still press forward. In the crush, many fall and are trodden underfoot to drown in mud. And now comes the arrow storm. The beleaguered Scots try in vain to find shelter from the deadly arrows. The pikes have lost their tight formation and no longer pose a threat to the English. The pikes that do wade through the mud do so as singles or small groups and are easily dispatched by the English billhooks. There is slaughter in brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Scottish casualties are heavy. The billhook, a modified hedging tool, has proved to be the better weapon on the day. Here in the centre, the tide of battle has changed. From his position along the eastern reaches of Brankston Hill, King James IV of Scotland has seen early success, but this success falters and no advantage is gained. He then sees disaster in the centre. But all is not yet lost. To his front, he sees the division commanded by the Earl of Surrey. And if he can kill or capture the Earl, the day will be his. But it is now that he makes his fatal mistake. He dismounts his horse to share the risk of battle with his men. James has more men in his division than does Surrey, but he knows that Surrey will soon be reinforced from the victorious English centre. King James must act quickly. He starts the descent of Brankston Hill, but ground conditions are similar to the centre, and the topography here is undulating, making it even more difficult for the pikes to stay in line. The Scots reach the boggy ground in the valley, and James fights his way towards the Earl of Surrey. Knee-deep in mud, progress is slow, 
and Surrey now holds the high ground of the ridge. King James receives wounds, but fights on. He is now in mortal peril. But there is still one chance for rescue. One Scottish division is not yet engaged in the battle. The free-ranging, hard-fighting Highlanders of Lennox and Argyll, armed not with pikes, but with two-handed claymore and Loch Arbor axe, now move to rescue their king. But as they start, in a final twist of fate, the Highlanders are surprised by the late arrival of Stanley's archers along the eastern crest of Branxon Hill. Devastating arrow storms from the English longbows kill or scatter the Highlanders. James's fate is now sealed. James continues to fight his way towards Surrey, but the Earl is well protected by his bodyguards. In the fading light of a dismal September evening, in the cloying mud of this valley, King James IV of Scotland becomes the last reigning monarch to die in battle in the British Isles. Flodden was the last major battle in 500 years of border conflict. <laughs>